Hello everybody, Assalamu alaikum, how are you? A very good morning to everybody in Pakistan and uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on wherever you're joining in today. Um, we are going to wait just a couple of minutes before we start the next session, uh, continuing on from day one from uh, yesterday, where we had some phenomenal success in this job fair. Yesterday, we had over um, 1,300 people join us. Uh, that's absolutely phenomenal for any virtual event. We have over 62 com exhibitors uh, conducting e-booths and virtually connecting with all our attendees as we speak. As well, we had multiple networking sessions going on. And most importantly, we had some very um, powerful star-studded panel sessions happening as well. Kyle Suva, we started off with um, um, very powerful people speaking on uh, for our keynotes. We had the ambassador for Denmark. We had the high commissioner for Canada join us. Uh, we had some amazing informative sessions about the skills and opportunities in the STEM sector, STEM being science, technology, um, engineering, and math. We talked about the regulation and energy policy in Pakistan at the moment. We had multiple um, energy and engineering related segments as well. We talked about the potential of e-commerce in Pakistan with some of the industry leaders as well. Shamim Rajani did a phenomenal job in uh, conducting and moderating that session. We will begin very quickly uh, as I segue into the welcome session for today, titled as Creating a Resilient Pakistan. Um, we understand that we live in 2020 right now, and we, as Pakistanis, have firsthand seen the uh, the effects that climate change and, you know, uh, raising temperatures have had on our lives uh, these past few years. Um, Additionally, rapid urbanization, uh, you know, modern infrastructure is, is just vulnerable now to an increased threat from natural and man-made disasters. This um, poses a severe danger to life safety and obviously leads to substantial economic losses. Um, as engineers and technologists and scientists, this is our forte and that is why we're very, very concerned about uh, these recurring natural hazards. And as these hazards increase, it is now all the more necessary to fortify um, infrastructure engineering, not just from you know a design viewpoint or a human-centered design viewpoint, but also from an environmental uh, and sustainability perspective. So for today's uh, panel, we will assess the uh, current opportunities and um, future ready skills that are needed for cultivating urban resilience in Pakistan and the best ways that we can face extreme weather events and climate change as we move forward. Uh, let me quickly introduce myself here for those of you who were uh, not here yesterday. My name is Ramla Qureshi. I am the CEO and founder of Women Engineers Pakistan, one of the organizers for today's event. Um, I'm also a PhD in structural engineering. So this topic is um, really, really close to my heart. And I would really like to um, learn from some of our amazing panelists and speakers today. Let me quickly introduce our speakers for today's session. We have um, Elif Ayhan. Elif, I, I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Elif is a um, senior disaster risk management specialist with the World Bank. Um, Elif, you've done some phenomenal work over the past few years. I've been following you for quite some time over on LinkedIn as well. Welcome. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Um, we have some interesting questions lined up for you as well. So I will um, inculcate <laughs> your input very soon. Um, we also have on our panel today, uh, Rabia Mukhtar. Rabia is a structural design consultant with the Natural Disaster Risk Management Fund. Welcome to the panel, Rabia. Uh, extremely honored to have you on board with us. It's, it's um, absolutely delightful to me to see women such as yourself who are absolute role models 
for upcoming uh, female engineers as well who have achieved so much in in at such a young age um we also have Mahin Malik, who is the country coordinator for the Alliance for Water Stewardship. Um, hi, Mahin. Assalamualaikum and good morning. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good, 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 good. So, um, Mahin and I, uh, for our audiences, Mahin and I, we went to the same um, high school and the same university as well. So, it's it's really good to have Mahin on here with us. She's done some exceptional work uh, when it comes to water and water policy, um, both in Pakistan and abroad. It's really a, truly an honor to have you with us today, Mahin. And we also have uh, invited Professor Sarosh Lodi, who is the Vice Chancellor of NED University of Engineering and Technology in Karachi. Um, he is currently um, not here, but he may join us very, very soon. Uh, I believe we should proceed with our discussion. And as soon as Professor Lodi joins us, we can learn from him um, on the topics that we're discussing. So um, ladies, first of all, uh, good morning or good evening. Um, I know Elif, it's really late for you right now. Um, I wanted to uh, discuss a little bit about the concept of urban resiliency as we move into this session. Um, based on the Rockefeller Foundation, urban resilience is defined as the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, uh, businesses, and systems within a city to survive, adapt, grow, no matter what kinds of chronic stresses and acute shocks they may experience. When I apply this definition to Pakistan, I take a step back in shock because I don't know if we, I mean, we survive and we definitely adapt, but I'm, I am wondering if we grow no matter what, because we are, um, we face so many chronic stresses, uh, not just in the hands of, you know, natural hazards, such as earthquakes, fires and floods, but also from extreme weather events uh, led by climate change. We we know that climate change is devastating lives um, and livelihoods, and if we don't get into uh, immediate action, we don't know if we would be able to make it through the next very crucial years. So Elif, my, my question first is from you. Uh, we know all of us here, we experienced this trauma back in 2005 when there was a, um, 7.6 magnitude earthquake in northern Pakistan. I remember we sat glued to the TV all day long as the death toll kept increasing. And we saw that the country suffered from obviously, you know, a large amount of fatalities, but also um, substantial economic losses. Um, uh, I believe some sources quoted to be almost 3% of the country's GDP. In, in your expert opinion, how do you think Pakistan has since then in the last 15 years enhanced its resilience to such natural disasters and have we sustained this resilience? Thank you. Thank you, Ramla, very much for the introduction and for the question. It's my great pleasure to be on the same panel with uh, Radia and Mahin and uh, Professor Lodi. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. I was trained as an engineer uh, as a structural engineer and I did my postgraduates on earthquakes and when uh, the uh, 1999 earthquake hit uh, Turkey which was a 7.4 times and times and smaller than the Pakistan earthquake of, of 2005 as uh, our engineer or engineering studying colleagues would, would very well know uh, all of my experience education, all of my masters, sophisticated studies meant nothing. I just sat, I was frozen uh, at the bed. It was 3 a.m. in the morning and I couldn't even move. And then what did I do? We didn't leave the house. We tidied the beds and everything with my mom. So I can only imagine the shock and horror of uh, 7.6 and more than 70,000 lives lost in Pakistan. 
it's it's beyond human comprehension in a way. No matter how much we know the science and technology behind it, it's beyond our co comprehension. And as you said, Pakistan has lost almost 3% of uh, their GDP with that one event and maybe a generation of kids, children, and young people. A very painful experience. Uh, what Pakistan did after the earthquake was remarkable, though. Reconstruction, recovery and reconstruction effort was, in our opinion, very successful, uh, very professionally managed, and we still show the reconstruction uh, experience of Pakistan as example to other countries. And following that, Pakistan has established very critical institutions. National Disaster Management Authority, its uh, local provincial district offices, uh, local disaster management authorities, and also National Disaster Management Fund. So there is a very, very strong institutional setup in place, especially the fund, in our opinion, a dedicated structure for financing risk reduction uh, is uh, a rare a rare setup uh, that we see. However, of course, uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, urbanization is continuing very rapidly. It's not it's not always up to the codes. Usually it's it's a it's an unplanned and maybe a vulnerable vulnerable settlements are being created, which increases the vulnerability and risks by the time. So our estimations show that if a similar scale event with 2005, God forbid, happens today, uh, it, could, it could cost nearly twice as much in terms of financial losses to residential properties alone. So this is very significant. Uh, we think the critical element remaining uh, as a challenge uh, in front of Pakistan is, of course, to address this huge risk of settlements, huge risks of residential buildings, public buildings, infrastructure, and uh, with the uh, excellent engineering information that exists in the country, with the excellent setup of institutions, uh, bring resilience into action into scale, uh, carry out the risk analysis, vulnerability analysis with today's information and uh, start implementing uh, long-term risk reduction programs, that's one thing. And of course, uh, improving building codes and starting to implement new settlements uh, according to the codes. We know very well that this is easier said than done. This is a very complex, very challenging uh, problem everywhere around the world. But nonetheless, this is something we all should strive for. Let me stop here and I'll be more than happy to contribute as the discussion evolves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. That was indeed very insightful. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Saab, how are you? Uh, it's an absolute honor to have you with us today. Apologies, I sir, was a bit. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Can you can you hear me? No. Yes. Perfect. All right. No, first of all, my apologies. I joined in a little late. You know, sometimes Saturday mornings. Uh, uh, so I'm here, all yours. Uh, it was really nice to see all of you. I was listening to Alif, and uh, uh, she has pointed out some of the very relevant issues. So uh, I'm here to take so the part we were, um, before sir before you joined in we were talking about um, the concept of urban resiliency what it encompasses uh, on its entirety and also we brought into uh, conversation the 2005 earthquake which was really a test of pakistan's urban resiliency and we were we i asked um Elif to talk about some of the um some of the progress that in her opinion pakistan has made so far so toss up um as as you, you are the Vice Chancellor, Mashla, of Pakistan's most established engineering university. I know that NED was one of the first universities to um, excel in earthquake engineering research in Pakistan. 
Uh, do you believe that Pakistan has quite captured the domains of urban resilience? Do you think our um, engineers and our engineering graduates are now equipped with these with the skills that are necessary for helping create a better, more resilient Pakistan? Uh, Ramla, the answer to this this question is yes and no. Uh, uh, yes, in a sense that uh, since 2005, there's a lot of work that has been done uh, to build capacity, to institutionalize uh, resilience uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, to create awareness. And then uh, no part of the answer is uh, that uh, uh, it takes a long time before uh, the desired results are achieved. It's been only 15 years since uh, we had this earthquake. Uh, and, uh, and the human mind and the, 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 is such that we forget things very quickly. Uh, even though there is and there are institutions which are available, there is a this building code which is also present, but the implementation uh, of these building codes and the capacity of the existing uh, building control authorities are, are, are still requires a lot of effort to be improved. Uh, apart from that, uh, the materials industry, you know, especially the materials used in the building construction has to actually come up to the standard where uh, the design specifications are met. Unfortunately, there is very little that has been done on that side. I'll give you an example, which I don't really want to make it very technical, but when you talk about reinforcing bars, the three bars that are used in uh, construction, which is very common in Pakistan, reinforced concrete, unfortunately, most of the bars do not conform to the standards which are according to which the buildings are designed. And hence, no matter how good the design is, when it comes to implementation, the construction lacks in the capacity. So there is a lot that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, there is a huge building stock uh, which was constructed prior to 2005 earthquake or which has which has deficiencies. Apart from uh, the building stock, the huge infrastructure, the, the road network, the bridges, the unburied facilities, the pipelines, uh, uh, you know. So there are so many things which still have to be covered. Uh, so there's still a long way to go. Uh, uh, I mean, I, 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 my, my safe estimate is that there are about uh, 16, 17 million uh, buildings in Pakistan. No, mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, something like that. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and most of them do not have uh, the earthquake resilience built in them. We have to change our construction practices. If you look at our building typology, I would say about 66% of our buildings are unreinforced brick masonry load bearing structures, which has absolutely no earthquake resilience. So, you know, we, we, we have to change our, uh, we have to amend our construction practices. And ab above all, we have to have a building control mechanism which is effective. And theoretically speaking, even, even if it's a single brick laid, it has to get an approval. I mean, most of the, the country doesn't have that system at all. So some big cities, obviously, like Karachi and Islamabad and Lahore, may have a better system. But to be very honest, uh, there is a lot needs to be done. Um, uh, the Islamabad, uh, uh, being the capital, has very important critical infrastructure. But uh, the construction of these kind of load-bearing masonry buildings are still very common. Uh, uh, so is the case in Lahore. I mean, I mean to be very honest, of the three, country, three big cities in Pakistan, I would say uh, that uh, the building control mechanism in Karachi is far better and far superior as compared to the rest of the country. But still, this is far from desirable. So, you know, building codes, institutionalization is something else. But in order to have better and resilient uh, Pakistan, we have to invest in humans for a very long time before the desired mm -hmm. update. Absolutely. Very well said, Professor. Um, we were talking about earthquakes and um, building resilience against earthquakes, which is a very valid topic considering Pakistan is uh, geologically situated you know, through the tectonic faults. We so we have major tectonic faults running through the spine of Pakistan. Um, however, Rabia, my question now is directed to you. We know that while we have natural hazards, we're prone to natural hazards like earthquakes and floods, especially in southern Pakistan, we are also living, um, you know, almost face to face with an impending climate crisis. Um, 
we, while we we are right there, we as engineers especially, we don't have to accept these impending disasters as in, inevitable, as has been the mindset in Pakistan that okay, it's from God and we can't do anything about it, right? We as engineers would beg to differ that we. So I I know that all of most of us here are um, structural engineers and we have this proverb or a phrase that we repeatedly say that um, earthquakes don't kill people, buildings do, right? So how do you think that Pakistan has scaled up this preparedness against um, disasters? And how? what have been some of the risk reduction and risk mitigation um, measures that, in your opinion, Pakistan has taken, which are noteworthy? Um, thank you so much, Ramla, first of all for organizing STEM Forward 2020 and hosting this panel on creating a resilient Pakistan. I attended two talks yesterday and it was an amazing experience learning from so many distinguished panelists one after the other. And today I'm really honored to share this space with uh, Professor Lodi, Alif, uh, Maheen and yourself. So um, coming to your question, first the disasters or so-called national disasters which are events triggered by a natural hazard like an earthquake or a flood are not natural. So a flood cannot be a disaster by itself and earthquake cannot be a disaster by itself. Uh, there has to be an interaction between a hazard and a human settlement. So if there are some sort of weaknesses and vulnerabilities within the human system, then disaster is very likely to happen. So firstly, we as human beings decide to live in different areas. Whatever is the reason, it's a human choice. Then we also build our houses and the infrastructure in a way that there are weaknesses and vulnerabilities within our settlements. Then we operate our socioeconomic system in a way that there are poor people, people who lack access to health and education and even disaster related information. So in a way, we create potential disasters for ourselves. So uh, the point I want to get across is hazards can be natural, but the consequences of occurrence of hazards or disasters are not natural at all. Uh, now, um, climate change. So as we see in available statistics, climate change is driving the disaster risk. And um, there has been an increase in the intensity of hydrometeorological and extreme weather events. Uh, there has also been an increase in the frequency of such events. Uh, for example, in case of floods, uh, there are now more floods and more intense floods. So in such situation, there's a big question mark on our approach. Uh, the way we make flood hazard assessment. So uh, conventionally, we were relying on historic data for hazard assessment. With climate change, we cannot rely on historic data because past events cannot predict future um, in a way and it tends to underestimate the future. So what we need to do? Uh, one way is to have climate change assessment first, then use it for hydrological modeling and then for hydraulic modeling and develop or revise design parameters for future infrastructure. And um, just as Professor Lodi told us that there's a lot of infrastructure, for example, in case of earthquake that existed in pre-2005. So there's, uh, there's a lot of work that has to be done in examining the ex existing facilities, if these can be upgraded or um, made efficient. Uh, so, however, in Pakistan uh, and other other developing countries, there cannot be a structural solution to climate change. Um, it's not always possible financially and for other reasons to have a structural solution. Uh, there has to be, and there are projects going on that involve non-structural measures, um, nature-based solutions, and community engagement at a local level to combat climate change and uh, foster disaster risk reduction measures. Uh, now coming to the point how Pakistan has scaled up disaster risk reduction preparedness, I must say um, that we have come a long way. Uh, there still is uh, a lot that needs to be done, 
So uh, let me break it down into two segments. I would say pre-2005 and post-2005 Kashmir earthquake. And uh, just as Aleph has um, told us that uh, 1999 earthquake was probably a turning point for disaster risk management in Turkey, uh, it can be related to 2005 earthquake in Pakistan. So um, during pre-2005, um, in Pakistan, we had this uh, Climates Act 1958, which was formulated because there were recurring floods in the country, and uh, especially in East Pakistan in those times. And uh, among all natural hazards, uh, floods were seen as the main challenge for the agriculture and uh, economic growth in the country. And But the Climates Act was concentrated on the response and relief efforts only, and there was no provision for prevention or preparedness. And this practice sort of continued till we were hit by 2005 earthquake when there was huge um, human and economic losses. And uh, Alif has very eloquently described the aftermath of 2005 earthquake in Pakistan. Uh, there was definitely a window of opportunity to build back better. Uh, NDMA was formulated. Um, National Disaster Management Act was approved. Seismic provisions were formulated uh, and implemented uh, in the building codes. A PDMA and DDMA were formulated. And we see a lot of progress in policy making, institution development, and implementation across all uh, national and subnational and local mm -hmm. levels. And now what we are doing, um, we have National Disaster Management Plan 2022. We have Vision 2025. We also have National Disaster Risk Management Fund, which is a government-owned not-for-profit organization. And why it was constituted? When there were uh, DRR activities already going on in the country, I must say um, that DRR activities were not very systematic, and there were overlaps and gaps. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, uh, NDRMF is being financed by government of Pakistan through loans from multilateral development banks and other international funding agencies. So the government is taking loans and to NDRMF, it is giving grants to the implementation partners. So, um, uh, it finances up to 70% of any project that has been approved. Mm -hmm. um, there are projects uh, ranging from um, multi-hazard risk assessment to improving uh, early warning systems, from strengthening flood protection embankments to development of disaster resilient coastal fronts. Um, so uh, recently, um, NDRMF has played very active role during COVID-19 as well, um, but that's not it. One of the objectives of NDRMF is development of uh, national disaster risk financing strategy and uh, disaster risk financing instruments so as to enhance the disaster risk reduction through some risk transfer mechanisms, for example, catastrophe insurance and catastrophe bonds. So uh, to conclude, I would say we started off with disaster management, which was a reactive approach, concentrating on response and relief. Now we are doing risk management on top of disaster <laughs> management. And if any agency, government, non-government, or research institution wants to do a project in DRR, financial grants are also available. And for future, we are working on having an efficient disaster risk mitigation mechanism through development of um, national catastrophe model that shall inform disaster risk financing and help in reducing the burden of disaster damages, at least uh, the direct damages, on the government uh, aid agencies uh, and the communities. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rabia. This was in, indeed very encouraging to know uh, that the government is invested in, in uh, disaster risk management and there are um, research friendly options available as well. Uh, we talked a little bit, Rabia, you mentioned a little bit about floods in Pakistan as well. So Mahin, that is a perfect segue into my next question to you that um, I know back in 2011, uh, we were routinely seeing on the news that there were massive floods uh, in, in southern Pakistan. Um, simultaneously, we also see this um, water deficiency in, in, for example, in heavily populated areas of Karachi. Um, it, it's, it's a bit confusing here that how is Pakistan, and I know the answer may not be very um, straightforward, but how in your opinion is Pakistan prioritizing uh, some of the most climate vulnerable people and ensuring that um, no one is left behind? What in, in your opinion is 
uh, the country's long-term vision that ensures a sustainable water management. Thank you for the question, Ravna. It is indeed, uh, I think it's a, it's a great question. But I think when you started off by saying that it doesn't have an exact answer, that's how it is. So uh, thank you very much, firstly, for inviting me for, on this forum, because I think there's a, nobody is an expert by the end of the day, and there's a lot of things that we can learn from each other. And that's how we should kind of go about taking life. So one thing that what, uh, I think it's important to understand is that considering we live in Pakistan, contextually, re with regards to water, we have very different challenges in all four provinces. So for instance, if one province is facing scarcity, the other can face water quality problems, while the third one can face, for instance, KPK has enough water, but the access to that water or clean drinking facilities or sanitation is missing, which is a big part of water as well. And then, for instance, you go to Balochistan, you have scarcity. You go to Karachi, you have scarcity. But at the same time, you have floodings. I think we've just seen that as well, I think, a couple of months back. I mean, it's in the same city. That's, uh, that's, that's very shocking. And again, then, you know, you come to... You, you come to Punjab, you have quality issues because you know that the groundwater is contaminated. And then you go to, uh, for instance, as in Sindh as well, where that's the thing that you kind of face both the problems. So when you think about water problems, you have to think about it holistically. You just can't think of it in terms of just quality issues or quantity issues. Or for instance, the problem comes is that there is a water management problem as well by the end of the day. And I think the biggest source of I think uh, kind of moving forward on that agenda has to be the national water policy that came out in 2018. That was indeed a historic document, which kind of makes all the work that needs to be done in the direction of water, including all possible communities, vulnerable people with regards to being affected by climate change and the vision that we kind of need to take forward. But, uh, you know, as things it is, the implementation is the one that needs to be carried out in the right direction. So considering that water under the 18th Amendment is a provincial subject now, each of the province is now making their uh, own act. So we have the Punjab Water Act, you have the Sindh Water Act. So according to whatever uh, you know, problems and risks are within that region or within that province, they kind of adapt to making changes up to that document to how go about implementing the national water policy accordingly. And I think that is the basis of the vision that we need to kind of carry forward so that we know, A, we're on the same ground because that was one of the historic documents where all, pro all four provinces agreed to. And B, we know that we're aligned for the same vision. It's not like, you know, one uh, province or one area region is doing one thing and the other region is doing another thing. So the idea is to bring everybody who's working in silos to come together. Collaboration is by the end of the day, it's, I know it's easier said than done, but by the end of the day, that is something that we need to align our vision by the end of the day, because that's how we go mm -hmm. about doing what's necessary. So that vision is there in the form of that national water policy. And that's something that we need to look forward to. And that brings in all possible things which are, I think, good enough for us to kind of see better as we kind of move forward in the direction of having a sustainable water management system. So I think that's that's the key. Very well said, Maheen. And thank you so much for giving us a very quick review of what the 2018 uh, document entails. Um, most of you touched on the part of how resilience is not just about you know technical knowledge and engineering it has to do a lot with you know better policies better financing better um community engagement and uh, we we know that developing community resilience benefits uh both you know disaster planners like ourselves and community members as well so it expands a um the the you know traditional ways of preparing for a disaster and it encourages actions while also promoting um, strengthening within the community systems and addressing um, any and all factors that may contribute to the entire setup. Um, Dr. Lodi, I, I actually took a course with you back in, um, I believe, 2013. And that is, I believe, when you um, authored this book. I'm not sure if it's visible entirely. It's titled as Zalzale, Khatrat, Nuxanat, Tahafuz, Bahali, or Tamire No. 
which if I um, loosely translate in my deficient English would mean dangers, um, depth, uh, would be damage, rehabilitation, bahali rehabilitation, and new construction. Um, this was one of the most amazing books that I have in my possession. Uh, so much so that seven years down the line, here I am in New York and I still have this with me all the way from Karachi. Um, there's something to be said about an attempt of this sort to educate all people in Pakistan. We as engineers, we tend to pigeonhole ourselves. Uh, just as Mahin uh, mentioned right now that we are work in silos and we like to work in silos because it's, a, it's an echo chamber of our own um, strengths because we like being told that we are technically sound. Um, this, a book of this sort um, educates everybody and treats everybody as um, a stakeholder, right? So my question to you uh, would be, firstly, how did the idea germinate to write such a book? And secondly, um, do you believe that now it's high time that we have uh, M multiple literature available on, you know, uh, disasters such as floods and fires and storms, etc., not just earthquakes, in Urdu available as well? Uh, uh, Ramla, uh, you see, uh, I was asked by, there was, a, right after a 2005 earthquake, uh, there were a lot of activities uh, uh, that were taking place, and so uh, the UN, uh, UN decided to develop, oh my god, I'm running out of power, and... Uh, I don't have any electricity at home. Let me see if I can get the generator going. I might be disconnected, but I'll be very quick. You see, what happens is that uh, uh, I was uh, asked by uh, the UNDP to write a small booklet in Urdu uh, for the journal people. And mm -hmm. I, along with my colleague, uh, Professor Rafiki, we started writing that booklet. And instead of a booklet, it turned out to be a book. Uh, so booklet was uh, was was there also, but you know this big size book actually uh, came out uh, as a result. Uh, to be very honest, uh, we need to have a lot of literature like this, uh, with especially uh, you know in different regional local languages, and a lot of capacity needs to be developed. Uh, but you know, no matter what you do, we human nature is that you know we try and. Uh, conserve our knowledge and try and limit our knowledge to ourselves. Unfortunately, that's very true as well. Uh, but the situation of collaboration and sharing ideas has, has, has tremendously improved over the years. I mean, when I started doing earthquake engineering way back in 1984, uh, you know, I, there was there wasn't hardly anybody who was doing it. Uh, now, now when you when you talk about these things, uh, people are aware of it. And, and there is a lot of collaborating mechanism. Uh, Pakistan Engineering Council came up with the building code. Now we are in the process of revising that building code. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of trainings at different levels at the masons and all those things. But, you know, retaining capacity is always a challenge. No matter how much you train, how much you build in capacity, how much you bring in people, we have other priorities and move on and, and start working and go back to our, uh, you know, areas of interest. I won't. I won't call it silos, uh, but uh, you know this keeps on happening. Uh, but some, but we, we we need to have cheerleaders. You know, somebody has to lead the chair. These cheers. Uh, uh, we have to have cheerleaders in disaster management. And since it is institutionalized, like NDMA and the entire uh, disaster risk management system, PDMAs and DDMAs, with with funding from N N ND, uh, NDRMF, you know, so you know these are the cheerleaders. Uh, individuals mm -hmm. are cheerleaders, but it's the institutionalized cheerleadership, and we have to have uh, we have to inject energy into the system by creating more and more. I believe we have lost Professor Lodi here, but I think he kind of made the point very very clear that what we have right now is a need for. Um, renewed interest in disaster management so that we don't come to a standstill uh, every five years or so when a critical situation happens and then we forget about it only for a next critical situation to remind us that disaster management is important. Um, Elif, uh, coming back to you, in your opinion, in your expert opinion, um, how do you think that um, 
Pakistan can inculcate some strategies to build resilient communities. So, for example, we saw in the time of COVID as well. I know that COVID is not directly a um, structural engineering. Well, it could be related indirectly to some of the aspects that we can think of in human centered design. However, um, how do you think overall any disaster, no matter if it be in um, the human context or a uh, environmental context, in ecosystem context, how can Pakistan build resilient communities and how uh, do you think, uh, as as Dr. Lodi was mentioning as well, how can we bring in the government and the development sector, such as the World Bank, as well as the civil society, um, together to participate? What are some of the best practices for that? Thank you. Thank you, Ramla. Uh, you know, I feel so fortunate. There are so many uh, inspiring and valuable points all the panelists have made, uh, right? And your question uh, nicely flows uh, through what I was thinking. I would claim, I would argue that uh, structural retrofitting helps with COVID response. Because it does. Because uh, the hospitals that we have uh, supported Turkish government to reconstruct or retrofit in Istanbul has become the uh, forefront of uh, the country's COVID response. The schools, the vocational schools, uh, retrofitted, strengthened for earthquakes under the project, uh, changed their codes, uh, uh, change their uh, topics or production and those kids those students they started producing uh, personal protective equipments for healthcare workers shields and masks which was as we all know and very scarce and still is very scarce so structural retrofitting or getting prepared for earthquakes helps saving energy uh, helps countries adapt climate change because uh, together with structural interventions we can we can take so many measures so as my introduction uh, to this question implies and maybe because i'm an engineer and we're engineers my thinking on this topic of building resilient communities is like this american movie mm -hmm. you know, the movie you know there was a guy who heard voices saying like, if you build it, they will come. And he built a baseball field and, you know, uh, so many legendary baseball players for them uh, came to play, you know, who passed away. So it was a kind of fictional romantic movie. But if we have, if we have, have safe school buildings, if we are trying to make a school building safer, those kids being educated in that school learn about the concepts then they they grow up thinking that okay earthquakes as rabia very nicely put earthquakes is natural earthquake is a natural phenomenon but my school collapsing due to an earthquake there is nothing natural about it that's a mistake that's a consequence of human actions Right, so I think uh, showing examples, showing real action and proving uh, communities, proving public that uh, actually natural hazards uh, can stay natural and uh, can their consequences can be managed, their disastrous effects can be reduced uh, is uh, definitely a place to start. Uh, Professor Bodhi mentioned training and education. Oh my God, of course, this is an, it, he's an expert in that area. And when I think about uh, the training activities we supported under uh, disaster risk reduction project, it goes to all levels of the communities, right? From decision makers at the government level, at the municipal level, to engineers, educating, providing them on the job training to how to apply new codes, new techniques, uh, training construction workers, how to carry out some specific applications, providing uh, community training to uh, public students, teachers. I'm, I, I, 
as you see, I keep coming back to schools because what we have observed in the projects in Turkey, in Romania, elsewhere is uh, if you if you uh, convince the kid, if you create curiosity in the children, that children, that child carries the information back to their home, to their mother, to their father, and when they when they grow up with this information. When they become adults, they demand it. And that's what we need. We need public to demand safe, disaster resilient, earthquake resilient settlements. We demand, uh, we need public to demand their, uh, their houses not to be in floodplains, uh, which requires proper enforcement of building codes. And it's not easy to create this. Uh, you have asked some of the some of the good examples. Uh, for example, uh, to to explain the students the concept of retrofitting in all the schools uh, that were part of the risk reduction project in Istanbul, uh, we have developed games to to explain and to teach the uh, students the concept of retrofitting. Uh, and computer plays because uh, today's kids are very much into the computers. Or for uh, nationwide engineers, uh, we have developed actual case examples uh, for them to learn how to apply the new building code. And I must say, uh, disaster risk reduction is no longer like something that, or earthquake risk reduction is no longer something that only happens in California, New Zealand, or Japan. Now we have uh, several very good examples of developing countries implementing these programs. One of them is my home country, and Zazele is a known word for me, that's why. And we have Romania, we have Philippines, countries in South Asia are very much interested. Last year, just before the COVID pandemic hit, uh, we have uh, visited the project in Istanbul with a, a large and high-level delegation from Pakistan. It was, I think, a very productive, productive study tour. So I say uh, it's time to take action. It's exactly. time to show examples. It's time to train communities so that they demand safe, disaster resilient settlements. Thank you. Thank you, Ella. Thank you so much. Uh it, I really am loving the flow of this conversation because, Rabia, my next question to you is exactly where Elif uh, has left the pen. I want you to pick that up and continue and tell us that um, now we are at the intersection where technology is basically taking over anything and everything that we do, right? And as engineers who constantly deploy, deploy technology, um, a lot of us get caught in what we term as core engineering. So if I'm a civil engineer, I only want to do a job in civil engineer. While civil engineering has given me, let's say, exceedingly amazing coding skills, I will not try to um, opt into jobs and opportunities that may be available for coding. Since we are currently in a virtual job fair, my question to you is that to young engineers and technologists, what is the, 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 the skills that they, in your opinion, should pivot to, to become more um, adaptive to what we think the future of work, of work would become, considering all of these uh, disasters that may be coming our way. Um, thank you, Ramla. Um, well, um, we live in a complex world um, that is interconnected in a way that we do not realize. Um, especially after COVID-19, uh, how a health emergency doesn't just remain a health issue, but it emerges as a socioeconomic challenge worldwide has uh, was uh, unprecedented. So uh, in this time and age uh, to find solution to our challenges, we need to adopt a multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary approach. And even during uh, pre-COVID times, uh, for example, for a uh, structural engineer or civil engineer, design and implementation of any civil engineering project essentially required a multidisciplinary collaboration. And collaboration is one thing that has been highlighted by all of, all of the panelists. So um, 
that is one thing uh, to uh, you know uh, be a team player, be a team leader, be a uh, be a, a problem solver. Uh, th there has to be a working knowledge of other trades, and uh, there has to be an understanding of the uh, language to uh, efficiently uh, communicate. Uh, secondly, market demands are changing. And uh, we cannot go on to align our professional goals with the market all the time. Uh, but what we can, we can do as uh, engineers or structural engineers is to think of the ways of leveraging technology, uh, computer science, uh, data science, uh, GIS, um, architecture, and other fields to boost our professional growth. So the question exactly. that one has to ask is, um, yeah, uh, what I can do uh, to compete with and outshine my competitors? Uh, why an employer would choose me among so many others? What additional benefit I can offer to my client or employer? So um, in my case, uh, I'm trained and experienced in uh, disaster risk reduction. So what added advantage my organization, that is NDRM, would get so definitely alongside structural engineering i bring a different perspective on the table from drr view uh, viewpoint and uh, mm -hmm. sometimes it happens and it has happened to me that there is an opportunity and you fulfill most of its eligibility requirement but all of the criteria and you kind of self-doubt or self-reject yourself so don't do it. Seize the opportunity and enhance your skill sets as quickly as possible. So um, I will give you, give you my example. I'm trained in earthquake engineering, which uh, doesn't uh, has a role as much as in uh, as in KPK. It doesn't have a role in Punjab to that extent. Mm -hmm. And the main issue here is floods. And I'm not a flood expert, but I'm a civil engineer and I have basic. Um, uh, undergraduate training in hydrology, hydraulics, and um, irrigation. So uh, this was, an, uh, as a structural engineer, I do understand the structural vulnerability in case of floods. And this is exactly what I said in an interview. Um, for a job in Punjab, when my recruiter uh, objected to my major, that is earthquake engineering, apparently um, not very relevant to the role I applied for, uh, I mm -hmm. did get a job, and then side by side, I did earn my post-graduation uh, uh, specialization and majored in flood. So you see, uh, right. mm, so you branched off yeah. into different expertise yeah, areas exactly. as well and made yourself more relevant to that. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much, Rabia. Uh, since we just have about nine minutes left, Mahin, I uh, will steal off some of your time and ask you to uh, perhaps tell us that now that engineers are getting more and more inclined towards helping Pakistan solve climate adverse issues. Um, what are some of the national and international collaborations that you can suggest for our virtual audiences that they can participate in so that they can help make Pakistan more resilient? I know we talked about collaborations, but maybe some specific names here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the question. So basically, if you're talking on an individual level, so people who are new, people who are interested, there are a couple of forums that are now, first of all, I'd say, for instance, Women in Engineering is one forum where people can join in because obviously they give you chances that will train you accordingly. Mm -hmm. Because we tend to limit climate change to just greenhouse gas emissions or we tend to limit climate change. But climate change has has a huge branch. It kind of collaborates with water in one side, with risk and disaster management on the other, with, the, you know, for instance, meteorological and all that on the other side. So it's important that we recognize all these collaborations. So I'd say uh, women in energy is another potential, since I know that they kind of train a lot of uh, potential graduates and, you know, a lot of tra uh, individuals who are interested in renewable and, you know, for instance, uh, installing uh, uh, solar uh, 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 it, installations so yeah. that's something that's something that's very useful secondly there is a climate action pakistan which is also a women-led forum uh, as, a, as a matter of fact she's a senior so i think uh, institutions like these or for instance for organizations these individuals who are already working for organizations they could for instance jo join the pakistan water stewardship network for, from an organizational point of view they can join citywide partnership which is a uh, which is a platform which has been developed by WWF Pakistan. Then there is International Water Association. Then, for instance, 
presence internationally, we have the World Economic Forum, and they have multiple forums on their website that you could possibly join as individuals or as organizations. Or, for instance, you have Race to Zero. So there are numerous ones. It, you have to go and kind of see which ones you're interested in, what or which uh, where your expertise lies, so that you can kind of contribute in that direction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was fairly quick. You were, you were, and you were very <laughs> concise as well. Thank you so much. You're we welcome. have some audience questions, so I'll quickly uh, chime those in as well. Uh, Doc Saab, let me ask you this question. Uh, Danish Name is asking that uh, what are some of the lessons, some of the key lessons from past experiences of national disasters in Pakistan that we can learn? And as young and fresh engineers, how can we inculcate these lessons? Uh, towards our practical life in preparedness and response for future unforeseen events. All right. So uh, first of all, my apologies. Uh, I just went off grid uh, for a couple of minutes. But, uh, uh, you know, so that is called crisis management. So <laughs> one, of, uh, one of the lessons that, that one learns from these kind of things is that you have to be prepared. That's the first and the key thing. You have to have an alternate system available and you have to have that capacity to react and to, uh, res to, to resolve the problem. That's the, 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 the most important thing. And that's the lesson that we should learn from the disasters that we are paying. You know, every mistake that we make, there is a cost attached to it. But, you mm -hmm. know, when you make a mistake, this is an opportunity to learn. And <clears throat> the sensible thing is that the cost of the mistake should not be huge. That's the lesson. That's the takeaway. We have lost 73,000 people in 2005 earthquake, unfortunately. And uh, uh, I, I personally feel that we haven't really learned as much as we should have, uh, despite of the fact that we have done a lot. So uh, the pre uh, whether it is preparedness or anything else, we have to learn from our mistakes and then build capacity. We have to have capacity of resources, human human resources, uh, financial systems, and believe in uh, what uh, believe in science. Unfortunately, uh, uh, when there is an incident, we, we there's a knee jerk reaction. We go and try and mitigate it, whether it's flood or earthquake or anything else, and then we forget about these things. So you know the lessons that we, the mistakes that we make, we we the huge costs incurred, but then the lessons must be transformed into public policy. If the public policy doesn't exist, then, you know, it's, it's, it's a lesson without a father or without a mentorship or a patronage, which is there. So, you know, exactly. I would, I, as, as uh, Mahin mentioned, there are a lot of international and national platforms. I would take an opportunity to suggest creating a platform which Rabia and NDRMF can fund of creating a national policy dialogue and a policy level forum which have technocrats and policy makers and policy implementers to actually keep on talking about these things so that uh, the, 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 the price that we have paid remains alive and then we are prepared for another uh, un, un event, uh, un, uh, unforeseen event. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. And I love the fact that Rabia, I saw Rabia taking notes as Doxa was speaking, so it seems yeah. like we would definitely get something in there. Um, very quickly, we have Safdar Mehdi from Vabda. Safdar Saab is asking that uh, we're dreaming for a resilient Pakistan, but it's difficult when we provide job opportunities to young graduates and as well as more and more educational opportunities in Pakistan as well. But we don't get as many corresponding um, jobs or people working as they would have hoped for. So I, I believe Sadr Saab is with the HR at Wabda. And he's saying that we in Wabda feel sorry to find that the list of applicants are, are uh, most of them are jobless graduates ranging all the way from, you know, 2017 sessions as well. So um, perhaps Mahin or Rabia, one of you being, uh, having Can like, I yeah, go ahead. So what I understand is that usually when you're looking out for jobs, people or, for instance, organizations, they tend to give you that bar of, you know, having two or three years of organization because nobody wants to make an effort to make you learn. And that's the problem where it is. You have to be willing to, you know, transfer that knowledge to a younger person. So, for instance, they're able to learn. And trust me, nobody has already learned. They have certain skills and you need to further develop them so that they could kind of apply them. Every job will have its own lingo, will have its own uh, set of expertise, have its own set, set of skills. You are going to take, take those skills and probably go to another job and learn more of, uh, you know, those skills. You could, technically can't replicate all of it every time. 
so you should be able to you know transfer that knowledge once you have uh, you know younger people with you so mm -hmm. a you have to stop asking for you know these big organizations need to stop asking for big experiences or big degrees because now nobody offers a job if you're just a bachelor graduate you at least have to have a masters and i think in the future that may translate into a doctorate which is not the fairest of idea because having all that uh, you know studious knowledge is important but having to go on the ground is as important so that's it's important that we transfer that knowledge and we are make we are able to kind of uh, you know make others learn while they're on the job because they do learn mm -hmm. there's a lot of learning on the job exactly thank you so much um uh, elif very quickly just perhaps in 30 seconds i would like you to and i i know it's not fair to give 30 seconds to such an important question but we know that there are dire gender implications of disaster risk management as you've been working with the world bank for um a, a long amount of time in your and you've worked in um a, a, you know a lot of the countries of is of this world that we live in. What are the gender implications that you've seen in disaster risk mitigation? So the, thank you. Seriously, what can I say in 30 seconds? But disasters amplify everything, right? The vulnerabilities, the, the sensitivities, and inherit uh, maybe more vulnerable positions of women in our societies as well. Disaster only amplify those. But we also know that women are resilient by nature, right? So uh, in, in the projects that we support, uh, gender uh, is one of our corporate requirements. So in every project, every program we support, we have to carry out an analysis to identify gender gaps. What do we mean by gender gap? In societies like ours, it's usually women who are maybe compared, compared, more vulnerable compared to men. But there are some cases maybe when are, men are more vulnerable than women. Identify those gaps through the project activities, try to develop solutions to, to reduce the gap, to improve the gender equity. Let me put it like that in 30 seconds, but this goes, examples goes all the way to uh, creating safe uh, and respectful working environment for women uh, working in the construction sector or engineering sectors or under the projects or if we are if we are helping capacity building in a search and rescue squad or fire brigade sometimes historical buildings even don't have restrooms washrooms for women or other spaces that they can use adding those spaces or other types of capacity building, training, vocational training, it may go all the way, supporting entrepreneurship. Let me stop here. I would love to provide more information, more examples, whoever in, is interested. Just drop me an email, please. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Elif. I believe this last question deserves a whole different panel of its own so that we can del delve deeper into this very important topic. But I, I believe you touched some very key points that we see not just in um, suburban areas, but also in heavily populated metropolitan areas. For example, not having female restrooms stops women, especially in engineering fields, from joining in certain com com companies in engineering. With that, thank you so much to all our very esteemed panelists. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sarosh, for making time for us. We definitely learned a lot um, from you through the years, but also through this one hour short session. Thank you so much, Elif, for your My time. Pleasure. I know it was very late for you. Uh, thank you, Rabia, and thank you, Mahin. To all our audiences, our um, digital expo starts now. Um, and I am going to switch off and hand over to the next panel. Thank you so much, everyone who tuned in to listen. Bye. Thank you so much, Ramla, for handing over. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Hira Vajahat from Women in Energy. We've uh, just had a really amazing discussion on urban resilience. Uh, 